Today we are going to be talking to one of the contenders for the Labour deputy leadership and that's Ian Murray. He's Labour MP for Edinburgh South and he is yet again the only Labour MP in Scotland. He, he enjoyed that unique um, attribute, what was it, between 2015 and 2017 Seven. and now again after the last election Labour lost all of their other MPs. Um, are you lonely, Ian? And a little bit lonely. I've lost a lot of good friends, but I'm glad you introduced me as the only Scottish Labour MP, and not the last, which some people tend to do. I wouldn't. I wouldn't have the temerity <laughs> to do to do that. Um, so, is that why you're standing for the deputy leadership, or one of the main reasons that you feel that you've you've got to effectively speak up for Labour in Scotland? Because if you don't win seats back in Scotland, it's very difficult to see how Labour can ever form a government again. Well, you're right. If I can, if I can spend a second just giving you a few statistics, if Scotland delivers a minimum of 16 Scottish Labour MPs at the next election, the Labour Party will have to win all the blue seats right down to Croydon South, which has a 21.8% majority. So that is an 11% swing. That's unprecedented. If we only deliver one Scottish Labour MP, we have to take out Jacob rees Morgan and North East Somerset, which has a majority of 26%. That's the task ahead of us in terms of the next election. It's impossible to do without Scotland. The Labour government still runs through Scotland. It's one of the political uh, the, the thing that's always politically cor- correct is it has to run through Scotland and those are the figures that are there so I'm saying to people look this isn't about just having a Scottish voice at the top of the UK Labour Party which I think is important and sends out a strong message to Scotland it sends out a strong message to all the nations and regions of the UK that told us on the 12th of December the Labour Party wasn't listening to them and do, do you do you think that many people in your party not just among the parliamentary party but more widely do you think they understand the significance of the defeat and the reasons for it? I don't think they do. And I've been boring my parliamentary colleagues now since 2014, since the independence referendum in Scotland, to say, look, not only do you have to understand Scotland as a starting point, but actually you've got to understand what's happened there electorally. And what's happened in Scotland is now spreading across the rest of the United Kingdom in terms of Brexit and and, and eating into this red wall of seats. And that's, from my point of view, that's the really interesting thing, because... I mean, if we'd had a conversation 10, 15 years ago about the likelihood of the SNP winning virtually every seat in Scotland, um, you would have laughed at me. And, you, you, well, I, I imagine you probably would have done so. No, 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 Scotland is a Labour country. And I would have probably agreed with you in the end. But, of course, once that happened in 2010, 2015, 2017, once Labour voters voted for the SNP once, they found it so much easier to do it the second time. And that, I would contend, is what's possibly going to happen in England in in a lot of these so-called red wall seats and you look at the majorities in seats like Mansfield, Sherwood which um, I think Sherwood did go Tory under the Thatcher years but Mansfield never mm. did and there's several others where they've now built up huge majorities Exactly and, and that's part of the problem that the Labour Party has and look it's not an argument about leave and remain in terms of Brexit, let's set that to one side although it is an influencing factor the issue has become that the Labour Party over the last few years on the big constitutional issues that people are talking about in the pubs they're talking about in the workplaces they're talking about at the bus stops with their neighbours their friends and their colleagues the Labour Party has been seen not to take a strong stance one way or other whichever way might be the right way they've stood in the middle of the constitutional road and they've been hit by cars from going in both sides and voters don't like that they don't respect it because even when voters who some of them been screaming at us to give them an excuse to vote Labour they've seen us as being equivocating on the big issues of the day that affects their lives and a political party who does that the public think they're just ditching their principles for electoral gain and it doesn't work well there's so many issues to talk to you about and obviously we're going to be taking calls after half past and the lines are open now oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three um let, let's stick with scotland for a, a moment because um i think you said at your campaign launch you you mentioned when john mcdonald was talking to me in my edinburgh show last august where he effectively seemingly off the top of his head but i now don't think it was off the top of his head single-handedly changed labor party policy um just explain when you heard what he had said to me what what went through your mind 
Well, I was astonished. Well done for getting him to say it in the first place. Well, see, I, I wasn't mean. actually sure what the <laughs> party policy was. I, I guessed, and and my guess luckily was pretty right. But just explain what, what he said and how he changed the policy. Well, the Labour Party policy has been consistently since uh, since the dawn of time to be against independence, but also to be against a second independence referendum. For the simple reason, we had a referendum in 2014 that everyone agreed afterwards was clear, was concise, was fair, and concluded the issue for what we're told a generation or even a lifetime in some instances. So that's always been the position. Now, all the arguments about process can go on in the background, but uh, John McDonnell came up to the Edinburgh Festival, did your lunchtime show, and decided to change unilaterally the policy of maybe accepting a second independence referendum that was then subsequently fudged to say not in the formative years uh, and then tried to change the policy. Now, Ruth Davidson had said something similar as the Conservative Party leader in Scotland some months before. David Mundell, who was the former Shadow Secretary, former Secretary of State for Scotland for the Conservatives, the day after had said something similar too. So it wasn't really a bombshell that everybody made it out to be, but it was the disrespect of coming up from London, getting off the train, turning up at the Edinburgh Festival, and unilaterally changing a fundamental policy of the Constitution. And it feeds back to what I said earlier. If the public think that you're just messing about on some of these big issues of the day, they don't A, respect you or B, believe you. And that was the problem. And it was a massive thing because it, it dominated the Scottish political media for the next two or three days. And understa- understandably so in, in many ways. And Nicola Sturgeon must have thought all her Christmases had come at once. And that's what I really... Um, annoyed me about what John McDonnell did because it then fueled again all the debate about the Labour Party doing a backroom deal with the Nationalists yeah. when all the mathematics so it showed that played it into be the possible. Tory hands as well as the SNP. Uh, as well as the SNP hands. The only hand it didn't play into was the Labour Party's hands and that's what's hugely frustrating about these issues. That's quite simply Labour didn't need the SNP to form a, a government. If there were a minority administration the SNP would have to have brought it down and brought another mm-hmm. Conservative government as they did in 1979 with 18 years of Conservative government that followed and also why change a policy that had taken so long to be settled within the Labour movement without referring to anybody in the Labour Party and at that point correct me if I'm wrong was it seven MPs seven Labour MPs in in Scotland and when you talk to your colleagues did they and many of them were in very marginal seats uh, and they all lost subsequently did they then see what the, the electoral consequences of that might be well it's very difficult to talk about uh, as, a, as an aggregate because actually ind- every individual seat is different and therefore some seats they may have seen it as being advantageous to have a slightly more um, fluid uh, issue on the constitution. But actually it feeds into the same thing that's happened with us with Brexit. If you've got a major constitutional issue, the Labour Party should be standing by its values and its principles of continuing to be consistent on the big issues of the day. And when it's seen that you're not consistent, the public just turn aside. If we were a party, we can't out the Nationalists mm. and we can't out unionism the Conservative and Unionist Party. And therefore, we have to come up with our own story, our own narrative about where we see the country in the future and how it should be governed. And just to play around with these things at the Edinburgh Festival was hugely damaging. In actual fact, would I say it cost us seats? Probably did. Um, could you make a direct causal link it would be unfair to do that, but it just feeds into the narrative that the Labour Party was hopeless. So what is your pitch to the Scottish Labour Party in this deputy leadership contest? Well, let's be principled about what we believe in. We're against independence for Scotland on the major constitutional issue because it would be bad for Scotland and bad for the rest of the UK. And let's get off of these issues around process about who has mandates, what we should do in terms of a second independence referendum, and get on to making the positive case for why it's important to be part of the UK, start making the positive case about why Scotland's a key part of the UK, and start attacking the issues around how bad independence would be. That's the narrative that we should be on, and that's what the story we have to tell. The big issue around my deputy leadership in terms of what I want to achieve in terms in the constitution is to finally take on board how, how you deal with England because the constitutional journey in Northern Ireland, Wales and Scotland is well advanced we all know it's well advanced, that journey will continue no doubt in the years to come but how do you govern the whole of the United Kingdom as a United Kingdom in a post-Brexit Britain that's a key task and the biggest task there is how you deal with the English regions London's got great autonomy, Merseyside and the Greater Manchester are continuing to get more and more autonomy and that's really it's showing results in those kinds of areas but how do you deal with the rest of the United Kingdom how is it governed and I think the public should tell us how they want to be governed in the future Well the problem is that there's no great appetite for any form of regional government is there we saw that with the North East referendum whenever it was 20 
what, when was it? I can't it even remember that. It must have been 90, It was quite, quite a long time ago, yeah. wasn't it? But yeah. I, I don't detect... And the problem with English regions is that how do you define them? I mean, do, in East Anglia, where I come from, do you include Hertfordshire, Bedfordshire, uh, Buckinghamshire in East Anglia? You do in the TV region. I mean, sort of Milton Keynes is considered to be in the east of England, which I've never thought it is. Where, where do you stop with the South West? It's, there, isn't, there aren't the regional identities in England that there are maybe in Wales and Scotland. Well, let's make them economic entities then. Can you imagine the economic power of the North East and North West and Scotland working together, trying to drag some of that power away from the South East, trying to be a, a big campaigning and lobbying body to say to the government that we need to be moving funds and moving powers to other parts of the UK. The, the important thing here is to allow people to come up with their own way of being governed. Ask them the question. And yes, it might be difficult to draw lines on maps, but that's not what it should be about. It should be about how people want to govern their own lives, where power is best to live, so subsidiarity being the driving force behind it. Rather than saying, well, Yorkshire doesn't really want to be one uh, one uh, single region or entity. It wants to be split in two. It wants to work uh, across other lines. This should be about economic development. It should be about jobs rather than being about culture and identity. You said let's avoid process, but you can't really do that, can you? Because if the SNP win the Scottish parliamentary elections in 2021 by a, a massive margin, let's say they get what, over 50% of the vote, they form a, a majority government, they would have a mandate for another referendum then, surely? If they asked for the mandate, I mean, Sir John Curtis, they who's, who's would. well, they, they they claim they asked for the mandate at the general election that's just passed, and they didn't. They said to stop Brexit and to lock Boris Johnson out of Number Ten. Was there two things that were written on the infamous bus? We seem to be writing all of our political slogans <laughs> on the sides of buses these days. So that's what they said. So if they go into the twenty twenty one election and the number one priority on the manifesto is to give us a mandate for a second independence referendum, what the Labour movement should be doing is to deny them that majority and try and win the election, but. My goodness, Ian, let's get on to talking about the disaster of public services in Scotland. No, fair, fair and, enough. And, and that's where the but debate should go in an election. you can't just sort of brush that away like that. Um, that, that would have been... I mean, they could argue, look, we, we stood in the 2016 Scottish parliamentary elections on this platform for another referendum. We, we in the 2017, 2019 general elections, and then if we get another mandate in, in 2021... I mean, even, even I would have to say that they've got a pretty good case then to have a second referendum. And maybe that is the time to grasp the nettle and say, right, OK, you want your referendum, you have your referendum and we're going to beat you. Well, if that in 2021 is what the SNP decide to put as the first line of their manifesto, then let them put it. But I'd be saying to the Scottish public, if you want to go down the route of constitutional politics, in the last 14 years, the SNP have been in power for 14 years, all they've done is manage decline in Scotland. Every single measure of every single public service is worse than it was when they took power. And we'd be saying in 2021, you need to vote for the government that is going to govern Scotland properly. And the biggest thing, I think, in all of this is that the Labour party from our perspective have to be a credible alternative government at Westminster because mm. if there's a chance that Labour can take power at Westminster then Scots will go we can have a progressive government at UK level and we can have a strong Scottish Parliament and get the best But of you do recognise the mandate that they would have in those circumstances and it, I mean, if Boris Johnson then said well okay I understand you've got the mandate we will grant you a second referendum the Labour Party is going to have to have a position there well, it will have to have a position, and the position for the Labour Party, even under John McDonald's time, is no to uh, independence, and therefore we'd have to start making the arguments about how independence was bad and how another referendum would be worse. And particularly as we're coming out of a post-Brexit Britain and what that would look like, the uncertainty that's all going to be in place over the next 12 months, the end of the transition period next year. So we have to be making so a positive So even in those circumstances, you would still want to deny a second referendum? We have to do what's in the national interest. And if it's not well, in the national, national interest, interest... is to just get the issue done one way or the other. Well, that was David Cameron's uh, mantra, wasn't it? And look what happened. It was. Well, that's because they gambled the country they, and he lost. They ran a terrible campaign. They did. And in actual fact, that's a big lesson for anyone who wants the UK to stay together, is it has to be a much more positive campaign. Yeah. There's lots of positive stories out there to make it a positive campaign, and we would have to do that. Much more from Ian Murray in just a moment. He's standing for Labour's deputy leadership. We'll, we'll move on to other issues um, concerning the Labour Party, why they lost, what they need to do for the future in just a moment. And we'll come to your calls at half past eight. 0345 6060 973. You don't have to wait till half past eight to get in the queue, though. The lines are open right now. It's 17 minutes past eight. LBC. 
Okay, people, let's get moving. All together with me now. That's it. You are doing great. G R E A T. Woo! Or leave the motivation to vitality. Take out our life insurance and you could save up to 40% on a Garmin fitness watch to help you keep an eye on your activity levels, however you stay active. Now that's real motivation. Just search Vitality Life. Life's better with Vitality. Variable discount. Postage and packaging terms and conditions apply. Marooned in deep space and no sign of help. Don't panic. I'm with the AA. The app lets you track the mechanic right to your side. I'm thinking of joining the AA. I don't think they accept cats as members. Who said anything about being a member? I want one of those shiny yellow jackets. Ow! There are lots of smart reasons to join the AA. You'll get unlimited call-outs, our tap and track app, and we'll get you going again in around 30 minutes of arrival. Switch to a different kind of breakdown service from just £6 a month. Visit the AA.com. New customers only. T's and C's apply. This week at Little, we're big on DIY Not. Get a flux cord wire welder for $79.99, an electric rope hoist for only $59.99, or a 12 volt cordless drill just $29.99. From Sunday, the 19th of January. Now that's big on quality and always a little on price. Subject to availability, selected stores excludes NI. Martin here loves being his own boss, but staying on top of all the tax rules used to drive him up the stud wall. This 31st of January self-assessment deadline, however, Martin won't be hitting the roof. Just a few buttons. He's using QuickBooks Self-Employed to make sure his tax bill is all above board. It tracks income and expenses, so he always knows what he owes. You could say he smashed it. Visit quickbooks.co.uk for details. Intuit QuickBooks. New year, new you, new car. If your car is over seven years old, why not switch up and get up to £5,000 towards a new Nissan Qashqai, Micra or the 100% electric Leaf. Switch up at a Nissan dealership today and make it a very happy new year. Available when you trade in a qualifying vehicle before the 31st of March 2020 at participating dealers only. Manufacturer contribution of £5,000 for Qashqai, £2,750 for Micra or £2,000 for Leaf. Excludes Vizier grade. Retail customers only cannot be used in conjunction with any other offer. See nissan.co.uk forward slash switch up. Nissan. Innovation that excites. Ah, working from home. Still in your PJs at 10.57, doing twice as much work as you would in the office. All while chomping on a crispy bacon butter. You can't put a price on that. Talk Talk Superfast Fibre is just £21.95 a month, fixed for 24 months. Oh, working from home. Maybe you can put a price on it. And with average speeds of 67 megabits per second, it's the UK's best value Superfast Fibre. Search Talk Talk Fibre. Talk Talk for everyone. Season and C's apply subject to availability. Leading Britain's conversation. Ian Dale. Tweet at LBC. Coming up to 21 minutes past eight on LBC. Uh, with me in the studio is Ian Murray, the Labour MP for Edinburgh South and Labour Deputy Leadership Candidate. Uh, we'll take your calls after half past 0345 6060 973. Well, Ian, let's, let's look at um, why Labour lost the election and what you think ought to happen in the future. Um, you're, you're seen as somebody who's, um, I hesitate to say this, but on the sort of Blairite wing of the party, um, which of course among Corbynistas is a big no-no. Now, he won three elections for the Labour Party, and yet this seems to have escaped the notice of many Corbynistas, and they don't understand that to win election, you have to win an election to actually get power and do the things that you want to do. Why do you think that is? It's very difficult because, actually, um, you've hit the nail on the head. You have to be in power. The legacy of what we've just done on the 12th of December is an 80-seat Conservative majority. I hate all these tags, Blair out. Brownite, Corbynista, you know, we're but, but all just you are, Labour. You, you would but, agree that you're on the right of the party? Well, I would agree that I'm on the centre-left of British politics. Um, <laughs> where I am in <laughs> terms of Labour Party is, 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 is neither here well, nor no, there, really, Look, but, you're standing in a de deputy leadership election. People need to know where you are. Well, absolutely. I'm pro-business. I think business is the driver of wealth in this country and provides the jobs. I'm pro-trade unions. I think trade union and business partnership is the best way to go. I think it's a fantastic way to grow and secure businesses in this country. I'm pro-public services. Uh, I'm pro-renationalisation of some industries that have failed in the private sector. I'm pro-regulation where the market fails. Um, I'm pro-investing in education because that's the biggest economic thing we can do. Um, I, I'm pro-pragmatism, but you have to do all that in government. And 
where I was so heartbroken on the 13th of December, helping some of my colleagues clean out their offices at Westminster, people who had been ministers in Labour governments, Vernon Coker and Gedling, uh, David Hanson, Martin Whitfield, you know, these were people who were ingrained in their communities. I helped them clean out their offices. And then I compare it how I felt. There's a 90-second clip on Twitter that does circulates now and again of Gordon Brown's 2009 conference speech where he reels off at least a very, very small fraction of what Labour did in government. And that cheers you up. But that's the story of this election and the story of this selection for deputy leader. Do you think there is a real possibility now that we might have seen the last Labour government? Well, there's a distinct possibility because the the, the party's got a choice to make. And I say this to members, and this isn't... Um, me just making this up. This is what the what the public have so, said to us. We have to be honest about where we're coming from here. The public on the 12th of December in the run-up to the election were in tears that they had voted Labour all their life and weren't doing it this time. And what did they do as a result? They voted Conservative. That's what we've left them. That was the, what we left them in terms of policy and what we left them in terms of leadership. And we just have to be honest about that. And the choice for members at this leadership and deputy leadership election is do they want a credible alternative government or do they want a diminishing party of opposition? And it will be a diminishing party of opposition because people, as you've already said, in places like Mansfield, have gone and voted a Conservative and Ben Bradley now has a majority of 16,000. That was a solid Labour mm. seat. So that's the choice that the membership have to make and I know what I want to do. I want to make us a credible alternative government. Is that part of you? Um, I mean, you're, you're... How old are you? 43. Oh, I was going to say 39. So. Thank you. But, I'll I mean, take 39. You, <laughs> but you must, it must have crossed your mind and maybe in, in 2015 think, well, look, maybe I need to do something else. Maybe this is not going to be something that, is, um, that we're able to turn around. And, and I think there were Labour MPs that stood down voluntarily at the last election for that reason. They were in their 40s, maybe early 50s and thought, well, I can actually have another career now. Um, is, in, in your sort of dark moments... Have you ever thought like that? Well, it all goes through your head in dark moments because you want to be in politics to do the things that you want to do for the people that need it. And you can't do that from the opposition benches. You tinker around the edges at best. And I'm very frustrated and very angry that what we've done is let the country down. And we haven't just let the Labour Party and the Labour movement down, we've let the country down and the people that want a Labour government. And the legacy of that is an 80-seat Conservative majority, Brexit on the 31st of January, uh, and a government now that has can do whatever it likes between now and 2024. That's heartbreaking for someone who's steeped in Labour values in the Labour Party, and we have to sort it out. But is there a glimmer of light for you in the sense that the Conservatives in 1997, they had 166 seats, they were facing Tony Blair with 100, 179 majority, and they did come back from that. It took them 13 years. Uh, and some people think that, well, all politics is cyclical and there's bound to be a bounce back at some point. I would argue that's not inevitable at all, that it, it will depend in large part on who the Labour Party elects as leader. I mean, obviously more so than deputy leader. Oh, absolutely. And that's the key direction that the party needs to go in. And I don't say, I don't, I don't favour any one leadership candidate over the other. I merely say that the architects of the past would find it very difficult to be the architects of the future unless they can find a different journey in a different direction. The public... You have to vote for Lisa Nandy then, or you have to support Lisa Nandy, surely, well, because she's, about... she's the only one that didn't have a hand dipped in the blood of the Corbyn project. But what, what, I, what, what the key thing is that people are entitled to change and they can change that and they can change the narrative and that's the challenge for all the leadership candidates is to say what's happened in the past have the proper honest analysis uh, look at Labour values and then move the party forward that the country want there is no divine right for the Labour Party to exist look at what's happened in Scotland that we've just talked about and therefore we either do the right thing in terms of leader and deputy leader or we make the same mistakes again and become a party but of perpetual opposition Surely it's incumbent on you as a candidate for the deputy leadership to say well I think X is the person to take us forward surely that is a piece of leadership from your point of view you say well I think they've got the right ideas uh, to take us forward and yet you're kind of saying well no I'm not going to do that and well the difficulty is a deputy leader has to work with whoever the leader is and it's not blind loyalty and I said this actually to one of the constituents of the Labour parties earlier before I came on this show is I'll be a critical friend because to be in order to be the voice of the membership and also to try and turn the party around you've got to be loyal to the leader but you've also got to be critical when it is required and I think too many leaders of too many political parties surround themselves with people that but just agree with Angela them. Rayner has said that she will support Rebecca Long-Bailey. I mean, they share a flat together, so you can kind of un understand that. Is she going to be a critical friend, do you think? 
I don't think uh, the way that Rebecca Long Bailey has her narrative so far in terms of her leadership campaign is right for the Labour Party in the country. If anybody, I, I, I'll say this quite openly, if so anybody we're narrowing thinks... narrowing it down a bit now. Well, if anybody <laughs> thinks that... Well, but Rebecca Long Bailey can change the narrative. She can change the direction she wishes to go in because it can't just be a fresh face and a fresh voice. It's got to be a new direction. And there's an opportunity to change that. And I've said quite clearly to anybody who has a vote in this election for deputy leader, if you're happy with where the country is, if you're happy with where the Labour Party is, and if you're happy with an 80-seat Conservative majority, don't vote for me for one of the continuity candidates. Isn't your problem, though, that um, politically speaking, you are probably close, more closely allied to Keir Starmer than any of the others, but you can't have now, in the current environment, another male leader of the Labour Party and a male deputy leader. That just... You can imagine the optics of that. Well, the optics of that aren't great, and in actual fact, I've been very clear that the leadership and deputy leadership election should never have happened at the same time for that very reason. If we're serious about gender, we have to do something seriously about it. I can't second-guess who'll become leader, and therefore put myself forward for deputy leader. But I've made this strong commitment that if... Well, as Keir Starmer in this sense, because he is the only man on the leadership ticket. If Keir Starmer wins, and I'm lucky enough to be deputy leader, I'll instantly start a consultation with the Labour movement about creating an equal second deputy position that has to be a woman and ensure that none of these contests can run at the same time again. That's the most I can do. It's a pledge that I will give. It's something the Labour Party might want to think about in any case. Um, and I think it's very important for the party to see that. What was the most disastrous policy that the Labour Party put to the electorate at the last election? It was an aggregate of all of them. The, d the most disastrous policy, I think, was the broadband policy. Not because in itself as a policy that was a bad one. In fact, the industry itself thought that 90% of it was, was quite useful in terms of taking control of the poles and ducts and allowing free competition in them. Um, but it was just a another thing added to the whole wish list of stuff. I knocked on someone's door who said to me, uh, Ian, what, what, what the Labour Party giving me today? And started to, they started to laugh. It became a, sort of, almost a joke. So, mm. And that was the sort of final straw of that joke. There was too well, much in which it. Which was weird, wasn't away. it? Because the, the great thing in the previous election was that they were able to say, look, we have costed everything. There was a document to prove it. I'm not sure they'd funded it, but they'd costed it. Um, and the Tories hadn't done that. And yet they didn't repeat it, or they tried to repeat it, but then they added the broadband thing on, they added the waspy mm -hmm. women on, and at that point, I think people just thought, this, this is just ridiculous, we're not buying this, it's, it's too much. And it was just another problem in the whole matrix of problems that the Labour Party had in the run-up to the election. They didn't think the manifesto was credible. Some individual policies polled very well. In fact, the interesting story of the election is some of the policies were polling at 70 and 80% popularity. When you told them there were Labour Party policies, it plummeted to 20. So that shows you where the brand problem is, but also the fact that the aggregate of the manifesto just wasn't believable. And you have to anchor yourself in some really strong policy positions, and you will lose people on the outskirts of those policy positions, but you've got to be strong to your principles, and that's what the manifesto didn't do. The two things in the manifesto I thought were fantastic. I think the analysis of the economy not working for the majority was exactly the right one. Whether or not the prescriptions of that were the right one it is up for the public to decide. And also I think the Green Industrial Revolution was transformational, and I think a major political party coming forward with something that's not only necessary but would actually have transformed the country would have been would have been great um we can't do that in opposition which is a lesson of the election well lots to talk about to with ian over the course of the next half an hour and it's your chance to ask him your questions love to hear from you if you're a labor party member who's got a vote in this if you're a trade unionist um but it, i mean we've all got views on what the labor party should be doing and let's face it if we want to have good government in this country we need a strong opposition um, do you think in 1997 to 2001 that we had, well, we didn't have a strong opposition then. Um, you might think, well, we, we had a good government, but actually Tony Blair could do whatever he liked. And you look at Boris Johnson now and you, you get the feeling that there are people around him who think they can do anything they like now with an 80 seat majority. So your call's next, 0345 6060 973. You're listening to LBC, I'm Ian Dale, it's 8.32. And Lucinda Horsley has the news headlines. 
The impeachment trial of Donald Trump, only the third time it's happened to a US president, has started in Washington. The Republican-controlled timetables causing a row. Democrats claim it's been rushed and rigged. The US president's accused of abusing his power by pressuring Ukraine to help him politically by investigating a re-election rival, something he denies. Jess Phillips has dropped out of the contest to be the next Labour leader, telling supporters she's not the person to unite the party at this time. One of the four remaining, Lisa Nandy, has won the backing of the GMB union. Mitsubishi is being investigated for claims it fitted illegal cheat devices onto its diesel cars. German prosecutors claim the car maker hid high levels of pollution, but the company's not yet commented. LBC weather mostly cloudy, but clearer skies over Scotland and parts of the north. Fog and frost in the south, an overnight low of minus one. This is LBC. January is tough enough without a broken boiler. Keep your home warm and working this winter with two years interest-free credit and your boiler installed by one of our expert engineers. Plus, you'll get a five-year British gas warranty. And we can even quote by video call after work or on weekends. Get a quote by the 29th of February and you can also get £200 off a new boiler or £400 off for our existing home care customers. Search British Gas New Boiler. Conditions apply. Let's get this right, sir. You didn't see three men dressed as clowns take off in a van with a Renaissance painting because you were distracted by, and I quote, a sporty red compact SUV with a bold mesh grille, a sculpted bonnet with sweeping roofline on diamond cut alloys. And beautiful rear haunches. So, you saw a Jaguar E-Pace. But what about the clowns? Uh, what? Clowns. Jaguar E Pace. Designed to steal attention. Search Jaguar E Pace. Marooned in deep space and no sign of help. Don't panic. I'm with the AA. The app lets you track the mechanic right to your side. I'm thinking of joining the AA. I don't think they accept cats as members. Who said anything about being a member? I want one of those shiny yellow jackets. Ow! There are lots of smart reasons to join the AA. You'll get unlimited call outs, our tap and track app, and we'll get you going again in around 30 minutes of arrival. Switch to a different kind of breakdown service from just £6 a month. Visit the AA.com. New customers only. T's and C's apply. As a small business owner, I need to know that when I'm out on business, I'm not closed for business. I no longer need an office. Just, um, a little peace and quiet at the boardroom table. Which is also the coffee shop table. At O2, we get small businesses. That's why you can work from anywhere on the best business network. Search O2 Business or visit an O2 shop. 2019 Mobile Industry Awards terms apply. See o2.co.uk slash terms. Have you ever bought an investment sold by Barclays, Halifax, Lloyds, Santander or any other bank? Investments like stocks and shares ISAs, investment bonds and certain types of pension can be risky. If you lost money, you could be owed thousands of pounds in compensation. To start your free assessment with Goodwin Barrett, text GOOD to 60777. Text GOOD to 60777 now. You don't need a claims management company to make a complaint, and if unsuccessful, you can refer it free to the financial ombudsman. Ian Dale on LBC. It's 8.35 on LBC. Ian Murray is here. He's Labour MP for Edinburgh South and Labour Deputy Leadership Contender. You don't spell your name the Scottish way. Just one eye, I'm afraid. Yeah. Cyclops. <laughs> do, you know, do you know what? My, I'm, yeah, I am actually a quarter Scottish, but the doctor that delivered me at the Evelyn Nursing Home in Cambridge on July the 15th, 1962, was Scottish and insisted that I had to have the Scottish spelling. Well, there you are. So you were always going to be called Ian, but... Apparently, yeah. yeah. And my middle name's Campbell. Well, you're much so, more Scottish than I am. Exactly. Uh, maybe I should be standing. Uh, right, let's go to the <laughs> calls. Um, Finn is a new caller in Edinburgh. Hello, Finn. Hello. Hello, what would you like to ask Ian? If there was a situation in the next general election where the Conservatives went down to 310 seats, Labour has 280 seats, and the SNP had 40 seats, would you form a coalition or similar agreement with the SNP so you could gain power in return for giving the SNP a second independence referendum they so badly crave? Good question. I know Finn because he's emailed me about this already. <laughs> I don't know if I've responded, Finn, have I? Finn, are you there? No, no, no. No. 
Yeah, I know he's emailed me about this already. Look, these are all the hypothetical uh, procedural stuff that we get wrapped up in, but I would have thought that if the Conservatives are on 310, they'd be looking at doing a coalition with someone who's... Uh, what does that add to? Is it 310, 2... 310, 280, and 40. So 320, so... 80 and the SNP 40. So that would leave oh, you with six thirty. The so there'd be an, there'd be another twenty four seats up for well, grabs. Well, there'd be now. the Irish. And there'd be the uh, Irish. There would be Democrats. well, the DUP. Would, uh, uh, the DUP in the previous parliament would have given you ten. So that would have been three twenty. So there's not three hundred and twenty six for a majority in actual fact because the speakers and the in Sinn Fein don't. Well, let's stand, not get hung so. up on the arithmetic, but the principle of it to get power. Would you do any sort of deal with the, the SNP? SNP? They won't form a coalition. The Conservatives. So. The SNP would only form a coalition with the Labour. But the question is, after 14 years of opposition, would you form a coalition with the SNP? Or would you say, no, we'll just be in opposition for another five years? Well, you'd always want to be in power, but the problem being that that, that's, that scenario becomes incredibly difficult in return for an independence referendum, doesn't it? Because you would have to determine what the rules of the game would be. You go into every election, of course, to win it, and you go into every election to win it well, and that'd be... Three ten two two three ten two eighty and forty gives you six thirty. There's another twenty odd seats up for grabs. So the arithmetic on that basis makes it incredibly difficult. The principle of it is that Labour Party's always said no deals, no pacts uh, with anyone. Um, and I would but, but parties always say that before an election. Well, they've but, got to, of course. Um, I mean, if we think back to 2010, um, Gordon Brown did his level best to do a deal with Nick Clegg. It didn't work out, but they were quite willing to do it. And, and Finn is surely right. Um, getting the Tories out, from your point of view, is surely the most important thing. And you have a lot, in, apart from independence you could actually rub along quite nicely with the SNP, couldn't you? Well, the SNP want to destroy the Labour Party. That's something I keep having to tell my colleagues. They, they are, with their biggest enemy is the Conservatives. They want rid of the Labour Party of Scotland. They want rid of the Labour Party out of any future independence referendum campaign. Look, these are, this is uh, something that, you know, hypotheticals over hypotheticals over hypotheticals. We couldn't possibly determine what would happen in that scenario. You're right about 2010. Gordon Brown tried to put a rainbow coalition together, but the numbers just didn't work. Um, and the politics just didn't work. So all of those imponderables would have to come together. Finn, thank you very much. Let's move on to, actually, before we move on, um, keep your calls coming, 0345 6060973. Charlie is in Cull Ross in Fife. Hello, Charlie. Hi there. Hi, what would you like uh, to ask? Yeah, I'd just like to ask um, Ian, how many times is Scotland going to vote for the SNP, who quite clearly has it in their manifesto, especially in um, the 2016, as well as the last uh, general election um, in the UK-wide general election, they had it in their manifesto for the right for Scotland to choose, um, as well as they've already got the mandate for the 2016 Scottish elections. And bear in mind, the Scottish elections use proportional voting, which is extremely hard to get uh, a majority. Although Alex Salmond and the SNP did in 2011, with 45% of the vote I may add, um, which I think, coming on to that, in fact, I think if the SNP did win a majority next year uh, in the Scottish elections, with under 50% of the vote, they would still be rejected because it's under 50%, which I think is actually ridiculous. Well, it's how you determine what a mandate is. I mean, you talk about the 2016 Scottish elections there. The, 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 the SNP government actually lost a majority in Parliament. It went backwards. In the 2017 general election, they went backwards. Um, and at the election just passed on the 12th of December, they got 45% of the public voting for them. And Sir John Curtis, who I ultimately respect on everything he says about polling, and I think he's well respected across all the political parties, um, has written an article this weekend to say it's very difficult to determine the SNP have a mandate based on what happened on the 12th of December, because A, they only got 45%, uh, and B, you can't really take one single issue on a general election uh, vote and turn that into a mandate for anything. So we just have to be very careful here that people who support independence, I can understand that they're desperate for another uh, referendum but I just think that we're trying to determine what a mandate may be uh, on the basis of something that isn't a mandate But if you if you had won the last election you would have considered that you had a mandate to nationalise um, BT Open Reach to do all sorts of things, that's what elections are all about you say what you're going to do and then you implement it. If the SNP uh, win their election in 2021 in, for the Scottish Parliament, with that as, as you say, their, their first and biggest policy, 
they've got the mandate, haven't they? Well, it'd be, have to, it'd be something that the Prime Minister will have to look at then. We'll be trying to stop them from getting that mandate. But the biggest problem we have at the moment, of course, it's not just in Scottish politics, but increasingly over British politics, is we're completely paralysed by these constitutional issues when we should be talking about the big issues of the day. So I don't think the SNP currently have a mandate for a second independence referendum. They'll find grievance and triggers for every single aspect that they, 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 that they want to find to try and hold a second independence referendum. I respect the principal position they take that they want Scotland to be an independent country. But as I agree with Sir John Curtis, there is not a mandate for it and you can't really extrapolate the, uh, the conclusions of the 12th of December election to say that they do. Chuck, well, you can. They got 48 out of the 50... 50 was it 59 cents? And sometimes parties believe in PR and sometimes they don't. <laughs> oh, God. Um, <laughs> Charlie, go on. You're sighing. Honestly, Ian, goodness me. It's, I mean, the 45%, right? Let's just say 45% or 46%, maybe 47 at this precise, precise moment, one independence. That's not going to go down any anytime soon. Ian's talking about trying to win Scotland back. I mean, let's be honest, I mean, he's not going to agree with me here, but I'm up here, I'm in Scotland, I'm Scottish, I can see what's happening up here. Labour's no chance of winning Scotland back for at least 10, 20, maybe 30 years, unless something seriously goes wrong in Scotland and it's down to the SNP, the bad, big bad SNP, um, I, I just can't see it. It's just not going to happen. I think Ian and the Labour Party, maybe not so much Ian, but others in the Labour Party, uh, and a few of them are actually, especially S, uh, NSPs, I think, um, uh, what was her name? Monica Lennon, I think her name is. She was one that was considering... Um, well, she understands that if Scotland keep on voting for... <laughs> a, a, a referendum or the right to choose, and um, then they have to have it, you know? Uh, I mean, is, is there not an up? argument here, and I think, Charlie, you're probably moving this way yourself, is there not an argument that, well, you've just got to lance the boil, just have the referendum, get it over with, and if, if, if rem- well, what would it be? What was remain it last time? Leave. It was yes, no, but I think well, it I mean, if, it, if it's remain, remain, leave, yeah. remain and leave, if it's remain, that really has to be the end of it, and that would surely be the the silver bullet that shoots the SNP. That was the discussion that happened in the Edinburgh Agreement in 2014, that would have the referendum, and that would be the end of it for a generation or a lifetime. Well, we have had Brexit since then. We have had Brexit no since then. I might like to argue that it shouldn't affect anything. It, it has. Well, that is the case, but the proposition that's being offered from the independence movement now is much more extreme than was being offered in 2014, a separate currency, being out of the UK and the EU, OK, admittedly for a period of time, but you'd still be out of both. Um, a border between Scotland and England, that's what's being argued in terms of that's Northern great, Ireland. That's so your point of view in trying to defeat the SNP, because well, that's the they, negative have, they haven't got answers for most of those things. Well, and they haven't got answers for what you would then do about Scottish exactly. public so, services, the So deficit. you expose all of that, and you launch a Hearts and Minds campaign to explain why the union between uh, the rest of the United Kingdom and Scotland is going to be valuable in the future. I mean, but you I'm, can see it now. I'm not one for risking the farm and, <laughs> and losing it like David Cameron did. I mean, he did. I mean, there well, is an out, the, the, nationalist movement, the nationalist movement in Quebec disappeared after the second referendum, but they won it by 0.003%. It could have been lost. I just mm. don't think we should take the risk on some phantom mandate that, that people are claiming the, that they have. I mean... Nicola Sturgeon said that a mandate for her would be consistently above 60% in the polls. I'm surprised it's not, given the debacle of Brexit and other things that are happening in the country. But there's only been two or three polls since 2014 that's shown, yes, ahead. And they've been ahead by like one or one and a half percent. So the Scottish people clearly don't want a second independence referendum and they clearly don't want independence. And to try and argue over a few percentage points here and there is missing the point. It, that's the voice of Ian Murray. He's here with me until nine, taking your calls. Oh three four five six zero six zero nine seven three is the number to call. Charlie, thank you very much for your call. It's eight forty six. Nick Ferrari at breakfast, weekday mornings from seven. The government's chief advisor on extremism has called for a clearer definition of extremism in the light of revelations that Extinction Rebellion and other non-violent organisations have featured in counter-terrorism materials. Is XR a terrorist organisation, Mr Secretary? XR is not, at the moment, classified in that way. Obviously, we have particular criteria to classify organisations uh, as prescribed. What we need to do is, is draw a line between uh, robust freedom of expression 
situation. And then there's a line that is crossed by people who resort to violence, threats and worse in order to advance their warped agenda. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. With Zero, Get your business digital ready with Zero accounting software. LBC. Marooned in deep space and no sign of help. Don't panic. And with the AA, the app lets you track the mechanic right to your side. I'm thinking of joining the AA. I don't think they accept cats as members. Who said anything about being a member? I want one of those shiny yellow jackets. Ow! There are lots of smart reasons to join the AA. You'll get unlimited call-outs, our tap and track app, and we'll get you going again in around 30 minutes of arrival. Switch to a different kind of breakdown service from just £6 a month. Visit the AA.com. New customers only. T's and C's apply. Let's get this right, sir. You didn't see three men dressed as clowns take off in a van with a Renaissance painting because you were distracted by, and I quote... A sporty red compact SUV with a bold mesh grille, a sculpted bonnet with sweeping roof line on diamond cut alloys. And beautiful rear haunches. So, you saw a Jaguar E-Pace. But what about the clowns? Uh, what clowns? Jaguar E-Pace. Designed to steal attention. Search Jaguar E-Pace. Here you are, it's January again. Nuh-uh, this is 2020, the year of the boss. The year you leave your same old job and boss the business of your hashtag dreams. And with a three business plan, you get exclusive benefits from FreshBooks, Moo, WeWork, and Wix. Oh, um... Plus, you can get unlimited data and you'll be 5G ready at no extra cost. Oh. So you can ride the wave of new biz like an absolute pro. Get a plan fit for a boss because three means business, just like you. Compatible device required. See 3.co.uk slash 5G. Will the retirement you get be the retirement you want? Check your state pension and see how you can build on it with a workplace or other pension. Get to know your pension at yourpension.gov.uk. Here at Tesco, we're celebrating over 100 years of great value with even more great prices that take you back. Like a 12-pack of bird's eye chicken dippers, now half price, from £2 to just £1. All this week at Tesco. Selected larger stores subject to availability offer ends 27th of January. What van carries over a tonne? What van has class-leading fuel economy? What van? The answer's in the question. The What Van Light Van of the Year 2020. The Vauxhall Combo Cargo. Limited stock now available for only £199 a month and one nine nine initial rental, excluding 20% VAT on a two-year lease. Other rental periods available. Search Combo Cargo Offer and hurry down to your local retailer. Vauxhall carries British business. Business users only. Initial rental of 19898 plus 23 months at 19898 Contract hire on Combo Cargo Edition L1 1.5 Turbo D 100 PS. 20,000 total contracted miles. Limited availability subject to status. T's and C's 18 plus. Price excludes 20% VAT. You will not own the vehicle. Vauxhall Finance PLC. Trading is free to move lease. This is LBC with Ian Dale. Call 0345 6060 973. It's 10 to 9 here on LBC. Just to tell you, at 9 o'clock, we're going to be talking about the impeachment of Donald Trump or the fact that he's actually not going to be impeached after this process. I'm going to be asking you whether you think that uh, he deserves to be impeached. Um, I remember last time we did a phone-in on this, I was absolutely astonished at the number of people who were phoning in defending Donald Trump. We'll see if it's the same tonight. Right, Ian Murray is with me until nine, Labour MP for Edinburgh South, Labour Deputy Leadership Contender. Um, Ed is in Kakadi. Have I pronounced that right? Kakodi. Kakod, I always get that wrong, which is a bit annoying because Dunfermline Athletic are my favourite football team in Scotland. Hello, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Ian. Up the Rovers, brother. <laughs> exactly. Um, that's <laughs> Gordon Brown's team, isn't it? Right, what would you like to ask? Uh, so, I was a uh, Labour uh, member, Labour Party member during the last election. My Labour MP was Leslie Laird, who unfortunately lost her seat. But for me, the... Important, the most important thing now is is to get Scottish independence. So I've had to leave the Labour Party. Uh, my support is with the SNP now because we have a, uh, a right-wing populist faction of the Conservative Party running the country uh, who's going to drag Scotland out of the European Union. And the only chance to, to try and stem the damage that that would do or, or to retain our membership would be to become an independent nation and apply for European Union membership. Uh, but we can't keep going on with Tory go government after Tory government. Scotland never votes for, well, the majority uh, never vote for. 
Well, the majority, I mean, sorry, it's the other Ian answering this first of all, and then I'll bring Ian in. The, the majority also didn't vote for the SNP, and the Tories, I think, am I right in saying they got the highest percentage vote share that they've had for, for decades in, the, in this election, even though they didn't weren't rewarded with the seats necessarily? But um, anyway, Ian. Well, look, I, I do just see that. I mean, Brexit will be bad for Scotland. Uh, we, we, we know that, not not because we we don't think know that, that you think that. Well, the government's analysis it. shows that. I mean, the government's treasury analysis showed that at least with the least worst option, two percent would be taken off GDP. Can, can you think so, of a single treasury analysis that's ever been correct? Well, we've got to go, have some kind of guiding light. And now, I hope there is sunny uplands with Brexit. I mean, the one thing that we will know is that the. Prime Minister is fully responsible now because he has this 80 seat majority will take us out at the end of next week and then we'll see what happens beyond that so um, Brexit is an issue now let's just hypothetically then say that Brexit's going to be difficult for Scotland the last thing I would want to do is to cut our nose to spite our face yes Brexit could be bad but Scottish independence on top of Brexit would be catastrophic now all the indicators show that there's a 13.9 a billion pound deficit in the Scottish budget. The, we would end up in a situation where all the arguments we've been arguing together with on Brexit about borders and about separate currencies and about different regulatory um, alignments would all come into play with Scottish independence and we're being offered a much more extreme one. So, you know, I fully understand that people are frustrated uh, and, and rightly and, and fully understand that people are angry and, light, and, and rightly, um, but let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater would be, be my answer to, to the question. Ed? I, th I think, Ian, uh, going back to you saying that, you, you know, you don't think that, uh, or you, you can't be certain that leaving the European Union is going to be a bad thing. Boris Johnson, before the election, was talking to Nick Ferrari on LBC, and he, he said he wanted to get TTIP signed. I mean, TTIP would be an absolute disaster, north and south of the border. And... You know, all the difficulties and the economic difficulties well, that... Uh, well, actually, uh, I, I, I don't think he said... I mean, TTIP is, is no longer... He did. It, it, well... He, he said he wanted... No, he wants a free he trade deal with... He, he wants a free trade deal with the United States. That wouldn't be a replica of the TTIP uh, proposal. Well, he quoted, but I'm quoting him for data. Okay. On Nick Ferrari, he said, I want to get TTIP signed. Now, of course, TTIP negotiations in Europe broke down, but it would be absolutely disastrous north and south of the border if uh, if we went into a, uh, a, a TTIP union with the United States. That would be awful. And all of the economic problems that independent Scotland may, may encounter... Think of the whiskey would, exports. Would, ...would far outweigh being in a, a union with the United States under TTIP. I mean, that it's would not, be absolutely not a disastrous for the people. It's not a union with the United States. Well, it would be a trading union. Well, it I mean, would be a trade it's, deal. It's a transatlantic trade and investment partnership. Yeah, it would be a trade deal. So, That's yeah. very different from a union. I mean, you make it sound as if we'd become a 51st state of the US. Well, OK, I don't, OK, not union then. It would be a trading partnership. Yeah, but that's a good thing. Um, Surely you'd want a trading partnership with the United yeah, States. Yeah, but just like the European Union, we'd have to uh, uh, regulate, or there would be regulations with our products to our products to align with the United States. That well, or the, or the other way and around. Then course, I and mean, then tra trade course, deals are negotiations no between leverage, two countries. Yeah. Of course we, we have, have no leverage. leverage. We don't, we don't have we leverage. Do. Across, We're one of their from, biggest uh, customers. Um, anyway. and, then the clandestine, and then the clandestine court scenario for large corporations that are able to... Yeah, well, that's why... That's you know, why, that's why it, the, uh, exactly. People, exactly, and that's why it uh, came to grief. And, and, and but, a, but we, a, a sovereign UK government well, why does not... Government want to sign that? Well, they wouldn't. That's, um, the, that's the whole point, because if it, that's the reason, or well, part of the reason, that TTIP came to grief before, because we found that unacceptable. Anyway, we're going rather off the subject now. Um, thank you but, very but, much. But uh, an independent Scotland would have to have a trading arrangement with England. Exactly. Which is the largest trading partner that Scotland has. It's worth mm. four or five times more in terms of income, in terms of trade, and in terms of jobs than any relationship that Scotland has with the European Union. So all the arguments, all the wrong-headed arguments, Arguments, in my view, against Brexit are exactly the same wrong-headed arguments against Scottish independence. Right, we've got another question on Scottish independence now oh. from Marie in Cumbernauld. Hello, Marie. Hello. Hi, what would you like to ask? Well, I would just like to ask you, apart from all the sort of things he said just now, why in his heart does he not want Scotland to be independent? Well, I think he's done quite a thing, good, Marie, quite a good mean, job of explaining that already. It's, it's a, it's a yeah, clear principle no, thing. I'm talking, I'm, I'm talking about a firm belief. I'm a wee bit older than you, Ian, and I have voted Labour all of my life and up until 2014. And I firmly believe 
Scotland having its independence, we would be a force to be reckoned with within this world. I think we can do good things. We're clever people. I think the SNP are the most trustworthy bunch of people I've ever seen in a government. Um, I believe in them, and I think they will do good for Scotland. It may be in 10 years of independence and with decent Labour MP standing that we would eventually be a Labour country. I mean, I'm left of, left of centre, but um, and as most of pe- the people of Scotland are. But, you know, I've voted Labour all my life, and we've been so badly let down by Labour that I never see us turning back to Westminster Labour. I think we may. If we get an independence, and I really hope we do, we will be, we will be a Labour country in our own terms and I cannot for the life of me understand why Scottish people don't see it the way See, this is interesting Marie because you're now the second caller and I appreciate it's two out of a, a, a nation of millions of people but um, they il- illustrate Labour's problem, don't they? People who voted Labour all their lives but now quite happy to vote for the SNP. Well, the two things that I, I would like to challenge Marie on is that I think part of the problem in politics at the moment, not just Scottish politics, is if you don't like my principles, here's another set of principles. And the principle that I hold and the Labour Party's always held is that Scotland is it's in Scotland's best interest to be part of the UK and in the UK's best interest for Scotland to be part of it. That's a principled position and I think to ditch that principled position for political expediency would be exactly the wrong thing to do and I would expect uh, Marie to be very angry with that uh, to, uh, in terms of a politician uh, doing that. The other thing I would just say to Marie is, you know, um, if she's happy with the NHS in Scotland at the moment, the education system plummeting down the world rankings, if she's happy with the mess of Police Scotland, if she's happy with the economy bumping along the bottom, if she's happy with all the problems in social care and the underfunding of local government, if she's happy for 14 years of isn't. managed decline that the SNP have governed over, then that's fine. But I'm not happy with no, that and we need to sort that. But she will say, and I would bring her back, but we've only got a few seconds left, she would no doubt say, well, under independence, Scotland could make sure that it improved all of those things. Well, uh, they're not improving it at the moment, the SNP level at Scottish Government. They've had 14 years and everything's got worse. Ian, thank you very much. Time has beaten us. That's uh, Ian Murray, Labour MP for Edinburgh South and Labour Deputy Leadership Contender.